Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, When I was in the under-15s rugby team at Sydney Boys High, I, I had a moment of great insight and illumination. I was at the bottom of a rock at St Joseph's College in the middle of winter, and as people delighted in jumping all over me, I thought, Gee, I'm a better runner than a rugby player. I think next year I'll do cross country. It was a great decision for me. It meant no one ever ran over the top of me ever again, but it didn't affect my love of rugby. And I hate to say it, I know it's treasonous, but perhaps my favourite team is the All Blacks. Uh, I just think, I know, talk to me later, I've got lots of problems. Uh, I just think... I just think anyone who can be that excellent in one thing is amazing. I mean, if I could be that good at brushing my teeth, that would be terrific. Uh, They're one of the most recognisable brands, and that's the language we use today in the world, aren't they? Uh, They're up there with Nike and Manchester United and the All Blacks. That black jersey uh, with that white fern can be recognised anywhere in the world. And when people see it, it's synonymous with winning, isn't it? Uh, The Harka is renowned just because it puts a chill up your spine and scares you witless every time they do it. And I looked at their winning record. Uh, Over the more than 100 years that they've been playing, it sits at about 77%. Since the era of professionalism, it's risen to 87%. And in the last 10 years, it sits over 90%. Isn't that amazing? That one team, one organisation, one culture can achieve that from a nation of over a little more than 4 million people. I suspect the fascination is in the culture, isn't it? How did a country that small produce a team that good? Uh, In 2013, James Kerr, who I'm told is a very famous author in New Zealand, I've never heard of him, uh, released a book called Legacy. He was given permission by the All Black organisation with a photographer to spend a year in the setup. Uh, His aim was to write a book that distilled the all black culture into business principles. Can you imagine walking into a boardroom and facing a harker? But he got it down to 15 principles and the first was this. And I think this sums up the rest of the principles. Sweep the sheds. Sweep the sheds. That's the culture that sums up the All Blacks. It means that no one is too big in the team environment, the team organisation, to pick up a broom and to leave the dressing room better than you found it. So Steve Hansen, the current coach, Richie McCaw, the greatest captain they've ever had, Dan Carter, the greatest point scorer, at the end of the matches and at the end of the time in the dressing room have been pictured in their suits with a dustpan and brush, sweeping up the mud and the sticky tape and the band-aids. It's a culture of humility, isn't it? Sweep the sheds. Sweep the sheds. It's a culture that says there are no duffers in this team, no hangers-on, no one too big for their boots. And when you combine that with the level of skill that they expect, and that's as simple as catch and pass, when you combine it with that, it weeds out the pretenders, doesn't it? It's a measure of selection that allows that culture to go on and on and on and identifies the next players. But let me tell you, it also holds out hope because you can make that team, can't you? 
if your skills and your sweeping ability are high enough. I think the Beatitudes, that section we looked at today, is about culture, about the way things work, about the way God's kingdom works, about the culture of being a citizen in the kingdom of God. It's the introduction to Jesus' most well-known sermon. But on first reading, let me tell you, I find it more intimidating than sweep the sheds. While sweep the sheds holds out a hope that I might make it, when I read the Beatitudes, you might be different, but when I read the Beatitudes, I think, who measures up? Who's ever going to measure up to that culture? Oh, we're going to think about that now. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into it. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can sit here today. Thank you, Father, that you implant your word in all of us. Thank you for seeing how it's being implanted in the hearts and minds of the young members of this family gathered together. Father, please open our eyes, hearts, minds to your word, to this culture, and please apply it to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you'll be sick of me beginning every sermon this way, but it's always good to revise, isn't it? Uh, Matthew's biography is about a man called Jesus and through biology, his family tree, uh, through announcement and uh, his ability to look the devil in the eye and tell him to rack off, uh, through looking at his method, which is speaking, so that the words of God roll back the darkness, through an insight, as we saw last week, into how he did this and the responses to him. Matthew is gradually building a picture of Jesus that says this, God promised that from the family of Abraham someone would come who would deal with a broken will. God promised that from the family of David there would be someone who would be a ruler unlike any that we have ever seen. And through that combination there would be someone who would save the world which is so broken in sin. Jesus is that bloke. Jesus is that bloke. And the crowds have flocked in. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, the crowds come in and they kind of, I don't know if they get in his personal space, who knows, but he wants some time with his disciples. The disciples are wholehearted student followers of Jesus. Just hold that definition. Wholehearted student followers of Jesus. We met the first four last week, didn't we? Uh, we met those two sets of brothers, Peter, Andrew, James and John. Jesus might have called some more, we, we don't know. And we know that he wants to spend some time with them, training them, teaching them, preparing them. So he goes up on a mountain to teach them, hence the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the crowds follow. If you get to the end of chapter 7, you'll find out that uh, the picture you have is, is this, Jesus in the middle the disciples around him, and then this massive milling group of people who are listening in. We need to fix that in our minds because getting the scene right will help us understand the tone and purpose of the sermon. This is not a general statement by Jesus on how everyone should live. This is not a replacement of the Ten Commandments so you can put it on the fridge next to them and tick them both off at the end of the day. This is not the way you get into the kingdom of God. This is Jesus teaching the disciples about life in the kingdom. This is Jesus teaching the disciples about life in the kingdom, a description of those who are already in. That's important for a number of reasons. It's important because we want to avoid making the Sermon on the Mount more than it really is. It's a training session, if you like. If you like football analogies, the team's turned up, the coach calls them in and says, this is the game plan. It's a reminder of what the kingdom of God looks like. Do you notice Jesus doesn't go up to the top of the mountain and put a flag up? The kingdom of God's not about geography. The kingdom of God is about rule. Culture, people living under God. Now that, as we've heard from Philippians 2, covers everyone, doesn't it? But only some who live rightly under God enjoy the life that comes with it. And Jesus wants to take these disciples and teach them what that is like. 
the language that Matthew uses, invites us to join them. Hey, if you want to know, join the spectators or the disciples and listen in. But let me tell you, if you listen in closely on your first reading, you'll find it incredibly depressing. Uh, before we get there, let me, let me just take you through what the structure looks like. Uh, page 1454, uh, we're looking at verses 3 through 12. We've set the scene, verses 1 and 2. I want you to notice that verse 3 and verse 10 are similar. Do you notice they both mention the kingdom of heaven? Do you notice they're both in the present tense for those who like their grammar proper? And then if you look at the ones in between, verses 4 through 9, they're all future, aren't they? Future tense. Verses 11 and 12 kind of hang off the back like a tail, a kind of unpacking of verse 10. Do you notice the repeated word? What is it in every one? It's blessed, isn't it? What, what does that word mean? Oh, we use it often, don't we? We use it to talk about a man who's had a decent crop, someone who's managed to get their children to adulthood without too many scars, someone who's retired well. And when we think about it in that way, we're actually talking about someone who's got something. But in reality, being blessed is about someone who's received something. Uh, literally, it means approved acceptable, stamped, to take it to its extreme. So the blessed person is actually the person approved. I want you to notice when you look through those Beatitudes that each of them has a characteristic. Did you notice that? Approved is the person with this characteristic and then it's not a reward but it's a consequence. It grows out of the characteristic, kind of like a tree out of a seed. Approved is the person with this and it will naturally, naturally lead to this. But it's pretty intimidating, isn't it? I mean, when, when you look through it the first time, is anyone going to be approved? I mean, I've got more chance of being the all black teeth brusher than actually measuring up to this standard. Because when you look at it, it is so pure, so perfect, this culture. It is so high. It almost creates an image in our minds and hearts that heaven's going to be pretty empty because who measures up and is approved because they have these characteristics? Uh, let's go through them again. Uh, we're there in verse 4, the, the mourners. Well, the mourners are those who look at the world and genuinely, from the depths of their heart, lament the state of the world. Not go, oh, gee, there's lots of bad people, but like Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he meets God and he realises who he is and goes, woe is me. I'm a broken man from a broken mob in a broken world. Verse 5, the gentle or the meek, uh, those are the people uh, whose humility is such that their constant desire is to put the needs of others first everywhere. That's their natural desire. And we're told in Numbers 12 that Moses was the most meekest man on the face of the earth. Think about how significant Moses is. How, how do we measure up? Verse 6, those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. I know what I thirst and hunger for, and it's usually on the barbecue. These people thirst and hunger that the standard and design of God be met in every sphere of life. Verse 7, the merciful. Well, the merciful are those who instinctively reach out to the marginalised and the ostracised, the, the poor and the weak, the oppressed and the rejected. They instinctively reach out to them and give them what they cannot have by their own nature. Verse 8, the pure in heart. They're people whose hearts are so single-mindedly on God that there is not a shadow in what they desire. Psalm 24 describes them as people who will inhabit God's mountain. And in Psalm 24, they're described as people who've never succumbed to vanity, lies or arrogance. Hands up. Verse 9, the peacemakers. Those are the people who walk throughout the world and spread peace wherever they go. The people, and, and by peace it's not, non-hostility, it's 
spreading the design of God for everyday humans wherever they go. They're, they're the people who make the world the way God designed it. That's a pretty special culture, isn't it? That's a culture we want, isn't it? That's a culture we yearn for, we desire, that we will do everything to achieve, but it is so far distant from us by our nature, isn't it? In fact, give me a broom and I'll sweep the sheds every day because that's going to be much easier than reaching the standard of this culture. I find that fundamentally depressing. (laughs) But do you notice Jesus doesn't beat around the bush? He says this is the culture of God's kingdom, the place where perfection reigns, where true life exists. Does any human measure up? It's going to be a pretty empty place, that kingdom, isn't it? Uh, On another level, I think that's exactly what Jesus is intending. It's almost as if he sat down these disciples and said, here, let me give you a theological ice bath. Let me douse you with theological cold water in case you think you are special, that there's something about the way you fish or the way you collect taxes that allows you to sit here with me. I think Jesus wants to do that. I think Jesus wants to present a contrast between this is what the kingdom of heaven is like and look at the world around you. How how good is this life? It is a pale imitation and perversion of the goodness of being a citizen in God's kingdom. But there's hope. There's hope. I'm at point three on the outline. I think there's hope on a number of levels. I think there's hope on the basic level where Jesus actually presents this. Jesus always speaks the truth and he presents this culture to people already described as disciples, men and and women. He seems to exercise a reasonable expectation that they know this culture can be part of this culture. And that means that, I think, on a deeper level, we will find the answer in the Beatitudes. Do you notice I didn't look at two verses? The book ends. Verse 3 and verse 10. Now, I, I think it's important to notice the little things in the Bible. Always important to notice the little things. Bethlehem, baby in a manger, is. Did you notice that in verse 3 and 10? It's present tense. It's a small word, isn't it? It's shorter than will, but I think it's crucial because I think when Jesus bookends the Sermon on the Mount, this culture with the present tense, he's saying it can be here now. It is a reality that people can possess the kingdom of God. What do these verses tell us about that? Well, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not describing poverty in a financial sense, is he? I can't find any way in which the Bible describes such a thing as good. In fact, I think it's a sign of brokenness, that grinding poverty out of which you can't escape. So he's not talking blessed are the poor in their bank accounts, is he? Uh, Blessed are the poor in what? In spirit, in their nature, in who they are. What what does that mean? What does it mean for someone to be poor in their nature? Well, remember Isaiah the prophet? He pokes his head up all over the place in the New Testament. He's a really significant figure, perhaps the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. But in Isaiah 61, towards the end of his time, working for God as a prophet. This is the picture that Isaiah presents. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion 
to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They'll be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. In Isaiah 57, God says his interest is in dwelling with the poor in spirit. It's almost as if Jesus has used that as the template for this sermon. Did you notice the familiar language? There's mourning and despair. There's poor in spirit. There's a replacement that grows out of that poverty. In fact, when Jesus preaches his first sermon in Luke 4, which passage does he preach on? Isaiah 61. When John the Baptist sends disciples to say to Jesus, are you the bloke we're looking for? What does he quote? Isaiah 61. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Uh, Here's my rough effort at a definition. To be poor in spirit is to be someone who has a realistic and humble understanding of who they are before God. It's to be someone who has a realistic and humble understanding of who they are before God. Uh, Put that way, it's the opposite of sin, isn't it? Uh, As I was teaching SRE this week, I was thinking, how how do we define sin? Well, sin's easily defined by the vowel in the middle, isn't it? I. That's the essence of sin. I am in the middle. Or if you want something a little more technical, it's the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. I am God and God is not. That's an unrealistic view of ourselves, isn't it? It's not a humble view, it's an arrogant view. To think that I and seven billion others could rule the world well. To be poor in spirit is to be someone who knows their nature before God. That they are a sinner. That they are a rebel. That standing before God they deserve judgment, not a welcome. It's to be someone stripped of self-dependence and self-reliance and self-rule. It's to be someone who is in the kingdom of God because they know they don't belong in the kingdom of God. Their citizenship, their part of this culture is not because of achievement, not because they're good even at fishing, not because they've got the right family tree or the right donations or a decent education. It's through a humble understanding of who they are before God, a sinner who needs God's mercy. But how do they get that? How how do they, we know that person is in the kingdom. How how do they get in there? Well, that's where I think verse 10 comes in, the other bookend. Look down there at verse 10 with me. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we could interpret it this way. Persecution in. But do you notice we're actually given a very important reason for the persecution there? What was it? For righteousness now we've just found out that we aren't righteous we don't measure up to god so what does that mean i think the answer is in verse 11 just look down there in verse 11 blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me that's important isn't it because the one who is righteous is who it's jesus So here is what it means, bringing these two together. We find that those who are citizens of God's kingdom are those who know their sin before God and are connected to Jesus. Those who know their sin before God and are connected to Jesus. The one approved for citizenship is the sinner who is connected to Jesus. The one approved for citizenship is the one who doesn't belong because they're connected to Jesus. Isn't that why Matthew had those names in the genealogy? Remember those names? The names of those ladies? Because they were women who knew their right standing before God and threw themselves upon the mercy of God. That's why the prophets are there in verses 11 and 12. Men and women with rough edges who knew their true state before God and God used them and took them because they trusted in God. 
That's why the angel pointed out to Mary that this little one she was to give birth to was going to deal with the sin of his people. Poor in spirit is a recognition of need before God and the righteousness comes from being connected to Jesus. We're going to see what that means more in depth over the next few weeks, but who's it available to? Because that's, that's a pretty important question, isn't it? Well, to put it simply, it's available to anyone who is poor in spirit and so throws themselves upon Jesus. Isn't that how God's always worked? Isn't that what we've seen over the last few weeks? That's always his method. That's always his promise, always his message. It's why the genealogy is structured that way at the beginning. It's why Jesus goes to all of Galilee. It's why he sits and teaches these disciples this truth from the beginning. But if you are a citizen, this is your culture, isn't it? If you are a citizen, this is your culture. Because I don't think Jesus is giving us something that's pie in the sky or mumbo jumbo. He's not giving us a too pure ideal and we just throw our hands up. This is actually the culture of God's kingdom. This is like sweeping the sheds but on a cosmic scale. If we are part of God's people, if we are sinners who are connected to Jesus, this is our culture. The citizens of God's kingdom at the last point on the outline are dependent upon God. That's verses 3 to 6. They know who they are. They're sinners. They know the state of the world, fundamentally broken and to be mourned over. They know the nature of true humanity, to seek the needs of others. They desperately seek and yearn for life as God designed it. Here's a suggestion. How about we start every day in the next seven days by saying today is a dependent day? Not an independent day, a dependent day. Because that's what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. Verses 7 to 9 are about the citizens of the kingdom actually living for God. Uh, they live for God by displaying grace and mercy to everyone around them. They live for God because their hearts and minds are undivided. What is God's will as I go shopping and talk to the checkout chick? What is God's will as I prepare dinner? What is God's will as I put my kids to bed? What is God's will as I get up in the morning? Living for God, they spread peace wherever they go. They make peace. I go to a lot of funerals where people tell me that the person had a life well lived. This is a life well lived, isn't it? Here's a suggestion. Just in one part of our lives that affects all of us. As we use the internet this week, how's our purity? How did I spread peace with that comment? How am I searching for a way to display mercy to those I meet in the ether? The citizens of God's kingdom will suffer. They'll suffer because of their citizenship, not because they're objectionable. They'll suffer because on their passport is stamped blessed. This week we must know that our citizenship will cause us problems. If we are citizens of God's kingdom, this is our culture. When we were living in Newtown, one of the great things besides the theological study was the food. Down the road at Petersham was where many people from Portugal had settled after the Second World War. And it became known in in some areas as Little Portugal. They do meat. That's unbelievable. Those little custard tarts and the bread, great stuff. It's great to go into that culture and to enjoy it. But but if the wind was working rightly, even driving down King Street and Enmore Road, you could smell the culture wafting up the road to you. I wonder if people can smell our culture. I wonder if people can smell us coming. 
Those are the merciful. They are the peacemakers. They're the pure in heart. That mob yearns for life God's way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful, a little outpost of the culture of the kingdom of God? Perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself, though, because there's probably a more important question just before that, isn't there? Are you poor in spirit? Are you connected to Jesus? You see, that's the first question, isn't it? Because that's the citizenship ceremony. Let me pray. Dear God, it is such a delight to meet such a confronting passage. That seems a strange thing to pray, Father, but it is good that you don't beat around the bush and that you set things straight, that you expose the culture of your kingdom and you invite us in through poverty in spirit and so connectedness to Jesus. Father, over the next few weeks as we think about what being connected to Jesus looks like, Give us ears and hearts and minds to understand and your spirit to apply. Father, if we need to be connected to Jesus, please bring us in. Father, work on our culture. Work on our culture so that people know the goodness of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.